on Dr. Phil. She claims her husband kidnapped her kids. He has a right to keep them from me. She hasn't seen them in 46 years. Two of her long-lost children are here. But this reunion... She remembers you beating her. I have never touched her. ...brings painful memories. Remember poking him with safety pins? Never. Pushing me in the bathtub and cracking my head open? Whoever told you that was a liar. I remember it. How could it be a liar? Let's do it. Is a safe place to talk about hard things. Stand by, Dr. Phil. I try to be an emotional compass and point you in the right direction. In five, four. I am not giving up on you. Go, Dr. Phil. Today, we are getting to the bottom of a decades-old family mystery. Now, this is Dottie, her husband, Bill, and her three children, Tommy, Teresa, and Tim. Now, they seem like a loving family, right? But 45 years ago, Dottie disappeared. The children always wondered what happened to their mom, obviously, right? Did she abandon them? Did she die? What happened to them? Well, it turns out that Dottie really didn't disappear at all. She still exists. In fact, she says her ex-husband kidnapped her children, and she has spent her entire life searching for them. Now, she recently enlisted the help of my good friend, Troy Dunn, also known as The Locator to help find her missing children. What Dottie doesn't know, and I'm gonna let you guys in on, is that Troy has found all three kids. All right? Now, two of them are here today. Teresa is here, and her younger brother, Timmy, is here. But Teresa's memories of mom, well, they're just not what you might think. My life with my mother was horrible. My mother was a very angry woman. She never smiled. She was mean. She abused me and my two brothers. So, if that's true, what kind of reunion is this going to be? Well, Dottie is still in her dressing room. She hasn't been listening or watching. She has no idea that her children have been found. She has no idea that her children are here. But before we meet anyone in this story, I want to hear Dottie's version of this decades-old mystery. Take a look. Bill and I had three children. My children were my life. I loved them. The abuse started six months into the marriage. If I didn't have supper on the table at 6 p.m., I got knocked around. He kicked me in my stomach when I was six months pregnant. He broke my elbow, he broke my wrist and my thumb. One time I was ironing a shirt and he yanked the iron out of the wall and threw it at me, split my head open. Another time he tried to kill me with a gun. He took out a service revolver and shot me. I have the scar in my arm right here. I had to get out of the situation. When I filed for divorce, I agreed to joint custody. The last day I saw my kids, it was Thanksgiving of 69. Bill was supposed to pick him up at 2 o'clock. He never returned them. I never saw my kids again. As the days went by, I came to the conclusion that he's left the state. My kids were my life. There isn't a day or a night that goes by that I don't think and wish I knew. And I just hope that somewhere out there, somebody knows. Now, when we tracked down Tim and Teresa, two of Dottie's children, they had a very different recollection of their childhood. Take a look. 
My life with my mother was horrible. She abused me. She abused my brothers in several different ways. My mother fed me bourbon balls and pushed me into the bathtub and cracked my head open. My father had to take me to the emergency room to have stitches put in. I don't remember my mom ever abusing us. I remember what I was told. She used to poke safety pins through my little brother's skin. He's got scars from changing his diaper. My older brother, she nearly drowned him in the bathroom sink. She strapped him on his potty chair and locked him in a closet. She was kind of portrayed to me as crazy, abusive. I was told that she had gone crazy and was in an asylum. The last time that I saw my mother, I was five or six years old. I remember when I was five, an officer asking me who I wanted to live with, my father or my mother, and I told them my father because my mother was mean to me. I was three when my parents got divorced, so I think my dad did everything in his power to keep the three kids with him. There was something that he must not have liked about her, and he moved us out of the situation. Years later, when I went back to visit my grandmother, I said, whatever happened to my mom? And she was like, didn't you know that your daddy kidnapped you from your mother? Your mom was crazy, and she didn't care about you. You're with your dad now, and your dad loves you and is going to take care of you. My dad was a good dad. I loved him very much. My mom was always portrayed to me as a villain. So she's always been a villain in my mind. Okay, it's good to meet y'all. I mean, this is obviously a very important day. Uh, you know uh, that we have found your mother. What? She doesn't know that we found you. She doesn't know that you're here. She's not listening to this right now. She's not seeing this right now. She, we, we have her sequestered. And she's going to come out soon, and I, I'm going to talk to her. You do have recollections about your mother, correct? Yes. And they are not warm and fuzzy. No. She abused me. She abused my two brothers. And when you say she abused you, what did she do that you recall? She pushed me in the bathtub. I cracked my head open. My dad took me to the emergency room to get stitches. Could it have been an accident? I don't think so. You, you remember it as being a violent sort of thing. She was a very mean woman. Uh -huh. She never smiled, never laughed. You said that your brother had scars. He had scars <laughs> on his and side they're, from and the you, safety you remember pants. That I used to push her out of the way to change his pants. I'm only two years older than he is. Because I didn't want to hear him scream every time she'd change his diaper. And you and don't remember this, kid. but you but you do have the scars. Mm -hmm, correct. How do you all feel about being here today? I don't hold a grudge <clears throat> against her. Um, she is my mother. Mm -hmm. I got to let, let go of what has happened and learn to like her, possibly love her. Even though... You recall though, her being mean, mean and vicious to I, you and I your two to. brothers. I, I can't get to the top if I don't let go. Look, I want to talk to Dottie alone. I, I, I want to get her side of the story. Again, she has no idea at this point that two of her long-lost children are even here. And so I'm going to ask Teresa and Tim to wait backstage where they will be allowed to listen to what Dottie has to say. I'm not going to let you see her. Okay. Because I, I, I want you to do that for the first time here. Uh, but I, I do want you to have opportunity to listen to her okay. and see what story she tells so you can respond to it when you come out. And then we're going to all get together and try all to right. get to the Sounds bottom fine. of this, OK? Mm -hmm. Sounds yep. good. Are you ready to do that? Absolutely. Yeah. All right, good deal. Um, so in a few minutes, as I said, Troy Dunn is here, and he's going to bring Dottie out right after the break. He was supposed to return the children to my parents' home by 7.30 Thanksgiving evening. And you've never seen him again? I haven't seen him since. For 45 years, Dottie has been searching for her three children, who she says were kidnapped by her abusive ex-husband, Bill. Now, she says he abused her, not them. She says she has tried everything to find her missing children, but just simply didn't have any luck. 
Now, Dottie recently enlisted the help of Troy Dunn. Now, you guys may know Troy as the locator, and she wanted to see if he could find some answers. Take a look. Have you ever wondered if they have ever looked for you, and if not, why not? I have no idea. Unless they were told that I was dead when they were young. It's very possible that they may not know the same version of what happened. I would say there's a handful of people who would know, which would be everyone who was related to your ex-husband. So for an entire family to collectively make a decision to hide children from their mother is an unusual scenario. It took a lot of work, I'm sure. So your belief is that your ex-husband, Bill, took to his grave the location of your yes, children? Yes, I do. In all of the 45 years, has there been a time where you stopped looking for your children? Never. They're mine. I was supposed to protect them, and I lost them. Do you really <laughs> want a relationship with these children? I want them in my life if they want to be in my life. Well, 45 years is a very, very long time. It'll be one of the oldest cases that I've worked on. OK, well, I'm here with Dottie and Troy. 45 years, that's a big gap to try to fill in, right? That is an almost impossible gap. <clears throat> I mean, when you, when you talk about a search that's 45 years old, you're talking about something that predates all technology that we have today. Exactly. It predates the memories of almost anyone that would have ever been involved. So let me, let me find out what happened, because I, I think this is, is very important if this is going to come to any kind of fruition. Um, we're talking 1969. Yes. And it's Thanksgiving, right? Yes. And you've never seen him again? I haven't seen him since. You think it's just a routine drop off it was just to their father? It's supposed to be his first legal holiday, uh, holiday visitation. So this was the first time? The first time. And when I did had... you realize they weren't coming back? What happened? Well, I had to go to work. I, I, for many, many years, I've been a nurse. He was supposed to return the children to my parents' home by 7.30 Thanksgiving evening. Mm -hmm. Did you call the police? I called the police. I went to the grandparents' residence, and she, I went up to the door with the police officer, and she said that they weren't there, they hadn't been there, she didn't know where they were, and quit bothering her. I had to wait till Monday to call my attorney because he was off on the weekend. Well, wait a minute. This is Thursday because yep. it's Thanksgiving. Thanksgiving Day. And so Thursday to Friday, Friday to Saturday, Saturday to Sunday, Sunday to Monday, these like long weekend here, four days. Right. You don't do anything? The police contacted both my attorneys. My attorney called me and said, that there wasn't anything he could do till Monday. He couldn't even get a hold of uh, my ex's attorney. And so there wasn't anything we could do. And well, what those about the days, police, though? The police couldn't do anything either. Well, they could did... not step in because it was a domestic thing and they didn't get involved in those days. Okay, but did you file a missing persons report? I did, and they said that it wouldn't do any good till after 72 hours. So you're just in a vacuum. That's right. Did you drive around and look? Did you go back over to the back house? To his, I you... went back to his parents' house. I went and knocked on the door, and they said if I didn't leave them alone, they would call the police. I told them, go ahead. I wasn't hiding. Uh -huh. I had never hidden. Because I'm just, um, this was 1969. That's right. And um, I remember 1969. I was 19. Uh, <laughs> at the time. We we're the same age back then because I was 19 at the time also. Or, well, I was like 23, I guess. I was 19 when I got married. So, you're not a young man, I know. But you don't look old. Well, I think your math is way to hell off. <laughs> He shot you with a gun? Yes, he did. Why did he do that? He was angry because I was putting the wrong clothes out that he was supposed to wear that night to work. You, 
you, you do everything, but you can't find them. So, Troy, um, it just doesn't smell right to me. Uh, she knows where the parents are. Uh, the, the police are there. Um, how can, you know, I came into this with the same unusual feeling that you're having, too, but I come into most of these searches trying to be... As, I'm a big believer that there's three sides to every story, his, hers, and the truth, and so I'm always looking for that third version. But honestly, everything that she <clears throat> tells about the, that era are, is accurate. The way that the police handled the situation, the fact that it was a holiday weekend in a small town where things shut down. Um, I think, and I told her this when we met, I would have had a tent and a chair and a cold beverage set up on the front yard of the house and said, well, I'm not freaking leaving here until somebody tells me where my kids are. She took a different approach, which is she came back to the house a few times. But in 1969, uh, a 19-year-old girl, I think she used all the resources she knew to use. She went to the house, she went to the police, she went to her attorney. She was 29, by the way, but go ahead. <laughs> I was old enough to, to know better, but too young to care is what There you, you go. Well, he gave away your secret. I didn't. I yeah, just want to make sure right. you were clear. <laughs> I actually believe that Dottie did everything she could do at that, short of kicking in the door, uh, I think she did all she knew to do at that point in her life. But 45 years have passed here. Um, it, it, it just... Have you continued to look? I was just going to say, it doesn't mean I stopped looking. Yeah. You did keep looking. Always. I mean, was this a... Every... every was this an everyday thing, an every week every thing, an every month day, thing? Every single Every single day that I could take off work, I... Did you find him? Nope. He, did he change his name? I have no idea. How long were you all married? Nine and a half years. Okay, did, so you knew his social security number? You had records? I have no idea what his social security number was because he kept it hidden, and every time I changed his... He changed clothes. He'd make sure that all his personal stuff was in another area so I didn't see it. Yeah. Did... He, he was like... I, he shot you with a gun? Yes, he did. It's yeah. right. If I mess up my jacket, they'll get mad. Well, no, you you do they there's, you do have a scar there. Yeah, I mean, a, there's you, scar on my something arm. Yes. happened to your arm there, no doubt about it. Why did he do because that? Because I was he was angry because I was putting the wrong clothes out that he was supposed to wear that night to work. Are you ever going to give up till you find these no. kids? Never. Why is it so important to you? They're after mine. All these... He has a right to take them. They keep them from me. I feel that I let them down because I didn't protect them from their father. And you're going to want them, if you ever find them, you're going to want them to know... That's right. ...that you looked. That's right. And Couldn't... I never abandoned them. I've always loved them. I'll always love them. They're mine. God gave them to me. <laughs> Do you think he gave them a good life? I have no idea. I have no idea. I have no clue. Yeah. If he was... If he treated me the way he treated me, which he did, I'm not lying about that. I can't... I couldn't lie about that. How do I know how he treated his own children? All right. Well, let's take a break. Coming up, Troy has some information for Dottie about her kids, but it, it just may not be what she thinks. We're going to find out more when we come back. And he has found out information about your children. Are you ready to hear yes. what he's found out, good, bad, or indifferent? I don't care what it is. My second husband was an angel from God. He was real supportive of me because I miss being a mom. I wanted to be a mom to somebody. I applied and was accepted as a foster parent. I have not stopped looking for my children. I'll continue looking for my children. My life is hollow without my children. 
not only incomplete, it's totally hollow. I know that I have surrogate grandchildren and children, and they're smart kids and they're bright kids and they love me and I love them, but nobody can ever replace what came from your body. 45 years ago, Dottie says her three children were kidnapped by her ex-husband, Bill. Dottie says that she has spent over four decades searching for her missing children, but had no luck. So she reached out to my good friend, Troy Dunn, otherwise known as The Locator, and he has found out information about your children. Are you ready to hear yes. what he's found out, good, bad, or indifferent? I don't care what it is. First off, were you able to identify the existence of these three children? Yes, we were able to confirm that there were three people with those names. And um, are they alive? Teresa is alive. Tommy is alive. And Timmy is alive. Oh, thank God. Thank God. I knew they were dead. I just knew it. Well, he not only found out they're alive, he found out where they were, and of course the question then becomes, do they want to meet they you? they want to meet me? Teresa and Timmy have said under the right circumstances they would be willing to meet you, and they consider this place, this moment, this time, to be the right circumstance, oh, and they are here. <gasps> really? They the are, here. are here. Would you like to meet yes, them now? Please, yes, right. please. Teresa, Timmy, come on out. Oh my goodness. <sighs> Timmy, oh my goodness. <laughs> I had no idea where you were, what you looked like, who you were living with. I thought maybe he even adopted you out. <sighs> You're gorgeous, you look just like me. You sound just like me too. I sound like you, your um, voice is just like mine. Yes, yes. Oh my goodness, we even got the same glasses on. Got the same color eyes. I know. Oh my goodness, my baby girl. I, I will say before we talk to these folks that um, your oldest um, does want to meet you, but he was a little overwhelmed by this environment and, and doesn't want to do it here, but is willing to talk with you, correct, Troy? Yep, that is exactly right. I want to ask three questions. Okay. Are you married? Yes. Well, I'm divorced now. <laughs> Been there, done two kids. that. You have two kids, boys or girls? One boy, one girl. How old? My son's 20, my daughter's 18. Ooh. Wow, I'm a grandma, a real legal grandma. Yeah. And you want to meet you. Oh, I want to meet them too. No kids. No kids? No, I'm gay. <laughs> Are you really? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right, let's just let's take a break right quick. Teresa and Tim, and listen, we, we, as I say, we deal with reality here, and Teresa and Tim say that their memories of their childhood don't even almost match up with their mother's memory of their childhood. We'll talk about that when we come back. I did think she was dead because nobody has heard from her. Of course, I haven't contacted her either or tried to look for her or locate her or anything. I do wonder why now. Why, after all these years, does she want to make contact with me? I'm 50 years old. I have not seen or talked to the woman in 45 years. That's a long time to go without talking to somebody. I am full of questions. 
Well, after 45 years of desperately searching for her missing children, Troy Dunn did the impossible. He closed the 45-year gap, and the, the family just reunited moments ago. Now, is, here's the deal. These two have a version of history that is very different from mom. She says that you were flat out abusive of her and her brothers. What do you want to say? You don't remember feeding me bourbon balls and pushing me in the bathtub and cracking my head open? Never. I never did that to you. Whoever told you that was a liar. How could it be a lie? I remember it very well. It wasn't by me. It was by you. No, it wasn't, baby. I swear to God, it was not my... I never you touched You don't remember you. strapping Tommy to his potty chair and locking him in the closet? Never. I never locked anybody in the closet. I got locked in the closet. Your father shot me with a gun in the closet. Remember I, poking I, him with safety pins? I never poked when anybody with safety pins. he changed his pants? No, never. Ever. I didn't ever, ever, ever physically abuse in any of my children. Ever. You didn't fight for us, though. I did fight for you. Mm, I don't know. I don't, I don't know. I've personally never been a parent, but I would have never, ever, 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 ever given up looking for my kids. Ever. I didn't Even if it was knocking down a door. I did not give you away. You were taken away from me by your father. I never gave you away. I never stopped fighting for you. I've never stopped looking for you. I looked in three different counties and five different states. He found me. <laughs> He's the expert. Thank you, Tommy. <laughs> well, but no, but here's the... Listen, no. this, is a, this is a relevant question. What he's saying is you didn't know where they had been taken. That's right. But their names didn't change. They were registered in the school system. Uh, you would only have to check 50 different states to find them registered in the school system somewhere. And what he's saying is 45 years is a huge gap that it took Troy's amazing expertise to close, but at the time they were missing, y you had the ability to call schools. You had the ability to I did reproduce call. those records. I did call schools, and I was told that their records were private I could not touch them. No, you're their mother. mother. Why did they give you Not the in record. the state of California. You are not a parent unless you have physical custody of that child. It's, that's just not, simply not I true. I don't believe that. I don't that is believe just that. simply not true. I swear to God, that is what I was told. You understand that Teresa believes that you didn't look for her because she believes you didn't want her because she remembers you beating her and injuring her as a child. I have never touched her physically, ever. You know, there have been, Dr. Phil, a few pieces of information that have surfaced that kind of, I would imagine, for you two, would cause you some concern that maybe, maybe what you were told wasn't completely accurate. Sure. I mean, I believe, Tim, you told me that you have vivid memories of your mother coming to the house, knocking on the door, and your grandmother telling you children, it's your mom, go hide under the bed. Correct. Is that true? That's correct. Well, that seems like a mom that was trying in some way to find you. And it seems like somebody trying to hide you, doesn't it? I mean, I don't it, ever tell my children to hide under the bed. It does. Somebody... I mean, I, I think it was probably something that my dad did to protect us. Um, because in, in, in his mind, or what we were told throughout our life was that Dottie, and see, I've always known her as Dorothy, um, was abusive. Um, but the point he's making is not whether there was a reason to hide you. Correct. The point he's making is it does validate the fact that she was banging on the door looking for you time and time again. Correct. And you say, why weren't you looking for us? Even your captors, which we now know were your captors, were telling you, go hide, she's here again Correct. looking for you. The question is, what do these folks do now? Obviously, there are issues in the air. Um, are they too big to overcome? We'll be right back. Tim and Teresa just reunited with their mom, Dottie, known to them as Dorothy, after being apart 
for 45 years. Now, Troy Dunn uh, made this reunion happen, and he's the author of the book Family, the Good F Word, uh, <laughs> which was recently published, actually, uh, by our publishing company, Bird Street Books. I heard you say you have no doubt that these things did took place, whether she's in denial about them or not, you know them to be true. You think she's not being straight with herself and or you. But your point is, whatever. It doesn't matter. I forgive her. It's, you forgive your mother. Exactly. Um, I'll never make it to the top of heaven if I don't forgive her. That's uh -huh. what I remember in my mind. Um, whether it happened or not, that's what I remember. But I forgive you. You're my mom. You know, she actually. Um, She actually held on to some of the toys oh my uh, that you, you played with at I the time. I don't ever played with these. <laughs> <coughs> you used to oh, carry yeah. uh, a little toy in your pocket everywhere. Do you? Um, and that I remember my little chocolate. dolly. You do remember this? Oh yes, absolutely. Forty-five years, yep. your mother has held on to that doll. Yep. That that all by itself has to say something to you. Well, of course. Jim, are, are you opening to exploring having some level of relationship with your mother? Oh, most definitely. Yes. And, Teresa, you, you, you say... <laughs> you say you forgive her, and people can forgive but not forget, and this is something that obviously weighs very heavily on you. Um, has this satisfied your curiosity, you need to move on, or are you willing to start a dialogue with your mother and, and, and see where it goes? Exactly, I wanna, I wanna build a relationship with her and, and see what happens. I would really like my kids to meet her. Uh -huh. And I, you understand that this has to go a step at a time. That's right, baby steps, honey, you, baby you, steps. You, I, I did want to update you on uh, a story that we worked on earlier. Two years ago, when we met Karen and her husband, Tommy, uh, Karen and Tommy had placed a child for adoption 41 years prior, uh, after Karen became pregnant in high school. Now, Karen was diagnosed with stage four lung cancer, and so she was desperate to find that son she had placed for adoption before time was up. You two were high school sweethearts. Yes, we met in our junior year in high school. You had a baby. Yes, right after high school. We just weren't ready at the time. So you placed him for adoption. So we did place him for adoption. It's very common that, unfortunately, sometimes people make mistakes when they're young, and then they go off and they go build new lives. But to end up together, married, all these years later, I was very moved by their story. You feel some sense of urgency in this this search, correct? Yes, sir, I do. Tell us why. Um, I've been diagnosed um, with stage four lung cancer. I am so grateful to be able to tell you he's alive and he's here. <gasps> Let me introduce your son, Dave. So, what happened after the show? Well, we caught up with both Karen and Tommy. Take a look. Hi, we're Tom and Karen. Dr. Phil and Troy Dunn found and introduced us to our son that we hadn't seen since birth 42 years ago. And we continue to enjoy and love and cherish the time we have with our, our son and his family. We have a wonderful 12-year-old grandson. We've had some grand experiences that we've never had in our lives, such as having Christmas and birthdays and things that have brought tremendous joy into our lives with our new family. We'd like to take this opportunity to thank Dr. Phil, uh, thank Troy Dunn. It just couldn't be more and wonderful. Getting better. It gets better and better. Karen, Karen is still battling uh, cancer, but she is defying doctors' expectations. Uh, we will wish them all of the best. Uh, now, Definitely. switching gears. Uh, coming up, an embarrassing body issue affecting millions of women 
and what you can do to manage it. I've said I'm going to answer y'all's questions when you send them in, so I'm getting ready to answer one of your questions. We'll be right back. It's no secret that as you get older, your body begins to change, right? I wasn't always bald, <laughs> um, at least this bald. And for some people, like my next guest, certain body changes can feel embarrassing at times. Take a look. When I get the urge to go to the restroom, I have no time to wait. It's zero to 60, I have to locate a restroom immediately. Laughing, coughing, sneezing will all result in a certain amount of leakage. The incontinence will range from a little bit of leakage to a full release of my bladder. In the past year, I've had to throw away between 10 and 12 pair of underwear. My kids know me for my various dances and facial expressions as I feel the urge coming on the Duke. It's a kind of traditional John Wayne cowboy walk. I then go to the mermaid. My knees are pinched together. And in the unfortunate event of a, an accident, I just kind of walk like a zombie <laughs> until I get to my location to clean up. I feel it's hard for women to talk about this topic because of the stigma. I believe it is taboo. Is this type of incontinence normal? If so, how do I move past the stigma and start living my life again? Well, Cindy's here along with Dr. Rachel Ross from the medical show, The Doctors. Good to see you again. Uh, as well as author and journalist Barbara Hannah Grefferman. So welcome to all three of you. <laughs> Barbara, what do you say about well, this? Well, you know, thank you so much for bringing us all together to talk about this very, very important thing that actually happens to over 40% of women over 40, believe it or not. And it's, it's a sensitive bladder, also known as incontinence, that can also cause a bladder to leak. And that happens very often. And it can be a, a result of weight gain, childbirth, some medications that you're taking. Yes. It can be a side, of, side effect of another common illness. And so as you get older, there are some things that we can do that can just make this a little more comfortable. Absolutely. But really, the key, though, is to never feel embarrassed yes. about this, because clearly you're not alone. No. Millions and millions of women are also going through this, and that's essential. You never want to stop living your life. You never want to stop being afraid to cough or sneeze or or stop doing the things you love to do. You've actually found out that you weren't the only one experiencing this, right? Because what happens, you get to thinking, oh, well, you know, I don't want to let anybody know about sure. this, right? Absolutely. Uh, as women, we sometimes talk about very intimate details of our personal lives. And it wasn't until I uh, read about the show, signed up, that I realized in discussing with my friends that a lot more of them were going through this and just nobody's ever discussed it. And as I spoke with them, I, 12, I, be, I believe I polled 12, 11 of my friends confessed to having some form of, of stress or urinary incontinence. Really? Yes. Really? 11 yes. out of 12 of your friends? Yes. Rachel, there are different treatment options, right? Absolutely, there are plenty of different treatment options out there, including behavioral treatments. And if you've spoken to your doctor about that, bladder training is one big thing that we do. And also pelvic floor strengthening. The pelvic floor muscle exercises are something every woman should be doing, whether they have this or not. And they're so easy to do, so discreet. You can just sneak them into your daily lives. So no one Standing in line at the supermarket. And the best part Watching of Dr. Is... Phil on TV. Yes, yes. <laughs> All of those things. All and of, of course, things. there are some quick and Please in don't make procedures. her laugh. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. But, this under but just, new chairs. <laughs> just as important, though, is being prepared with the right protection. Yes. Right? Now, Always has come out with a new line of products called Always Discreet with liners and pads and also disposable underwear. This line also has um, a dual leak guard barrier, which is key. So with there being so many options out there, as well as in-office procedures, particularly talk to your doctor about which option is going to be right for you. Because I, I noticed also you said that you wear more skirts now. Yes. Because it's much easier, easier access when you're actually going to the bathroom. So Absolutely. It really does sound sounds like the disposable neat. underwear are the best option for you. Whichever you choose, you really want to look at sensitive bladder in the face and say, you know what, you're not ruling my life. And the topic that you brought up is just opening up this 
a whole new world for women. So there's, I mean, you're now aware of the fact that there's other options out yeah, there. I'm glad and... you came to talk about it. Did you learn something new? Yeah, today? I've learned a lot. <laughs> I, I mean, uh, and, you know, Barbara, you're actually going to be on The Doctors and you're going to talk about this yeah. topic. Yes, I'm like, I actually can't wait because there's so much more to talk about. And until then, I really encourage everyone, including you, Sydney, to go on to alwaysdiscreet.com to find out more tips and to ask more questions very discreetly, anonymously, and also to look at some of the articles that I've written about living your best life. There was one more thing that you wanted to share, Barbara, right? Oh, yes, this is very exciting. Now, the line of Always Discreet products are available at Dollar General. And I'm very, very pleased to tell you that everyone here in the audience is leaving today with a gift card from Dollar General for $75. Thanks for being here today, especially my good friend Troy Dunn. Troy and his team continue to stand ready to help those searching for a long-lost loved one. You can reach Troy at TroyTheLocator.com. Troy's book, Family, the Good F Word, is available through our own publishing company, Bird Street Books. I'd also like to thank Dr. Rachel Ross and Barbara Hannah Grufferman. Uh, thank you guys for enlightening everybody on this. And thank you for being willing to talk about it. For more information on today's show, be sure to check out drphil.com. We'll see you next time. Today on Dr. Phil, she thought she had the perfect family. He was the best dad. She had no idea. The victims had their feet found and their eyes covered with tape. That her husband. You found ladies nylons. He says these are for you. Was a predator. I found this brown paper bag with zip ties and syringes. Police found a stun gun, handcuffs, and leg shackles in his car. Have you been living with a serial rapist? Let's do it. Have a good show, everybody. Here we go. This is a safe place to talk about hard things. Stand by. We'll count you down. I try to be an emotional compass and point you in the right direction. Five, four. I am not giving up on you. Imagine this scenario. A beautiful stay-at-home mom married to her high school sweetheart. Four kids, a lovely home, and a seemingly good life. It's easy to picture, right? What if one day you found out that the man that you slept with every night, the father of your children, the man you sat with and watched television, was all of a sudden accused of living a secret life? And in fact, of being the very monster that you had been reading about and seeing on the news in your town? Well, this is what happened to this wife when police stopped her husband's car for a minor traffic violation. The officers noticed blankets partially covering some of the windows. With his consent, the officers searched the vehicle and what they found was disturbing. They found handcuffs, ladies' nylons, syringes, a stun gun, prescription drug vials, adhesive tape, and metal leg shackles. Now, why on earth would he have these items in his car? Well, the police had their suspicions. We are beginning tonight on the arrest of a Salinas man. Police say is a serial rapist. The 40-year-old suspect, Lonnie Keith, has so far been charged with two counts of kidnapping and one count of rape. He's also the prime suspect in nine similar unsolved sexual assaults. Both victims had their hands and feet bound with plastic zip ties and their eyes covered with tape. Detectives later searched his home and found syringes, vials of sedatives, handcuffs, leg restraints, and other items that they believe he had ready for another attack. This suspect had created a cave, if you will, in the back of his vehicle. Cops say blankets covered the windows of his vehicle. He allegedly strong-armed women into the back seat, stick them with a hypodermic needle, and drug them. Then cops say he'd tie them up and rape them. 
Neighbors say Keith loved playing sports with his kids, and his wife organized Fourth of July block parties. Keith is a physician's assistant and is the married father of four. Lonnie Keith's wife, Carrie, says her life changed forever when the police came to her home at 7 a.m. to break the news that her husband of 15 years had been arrested and charged with being a serial rapist. My life was turned upside down a year ago. I was awoken to police officers outside of my home. They told me that my husband had been arrested on suspicion of kidnapping and possible rape. I was shocked. I thought, this can't be true. You have the wrong person. The detectives told me that young women were sedated and sexually assaulted. And they said, Bonnie fit the description in the car. They found leg restraints, handcuffs, zip ties, nylons, and syringes. The medical stuff, he said that it was just left over from the night before, which made sense. He worked in a hospital. I asked him why they found restraints or the women's nylons, and he suggested that they were for me. I'm not into bondage and those type of things, so that did make me feel weird. I just kept saying to myself, this can't be happening. Lonnie and I were married for 15 years. It scares me that if they do have the right guy, I laid next to him in bed and had a family with him. Lonnie never showed me any signs of any kind of hate towards women. We have two daughters together, and he was the best dad since he's been gone. The girls don't want to talk about their dad being in jail. There was some teasing for my son at school. It's hard to think that somebody who you've been with for half of your life could at all be accused of something so heinous. All right, Carrie, I I'm glad to meet you, but I'm sorry for the circumstance. We always talk about hindsight being 2020. As you now look back, do you see things now that didn't register with you at the time? Honestly, sorry, my voice. That's right. Um, honestly, the things that I did see and find, he was having an affair, and I found out about that in, like, October of 11. Right. And the things I found, I always thought were for her. So as far as seeing this, no, no, absolutely not. Now, he's been arrested, he's been indicted, he's pled not guilty, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and... So we have to treat these as allegations because he's not been convicted of it. Right. I wrote some things down for us to look at. You found some things in the home at yes. the time. They were in paper bags in two different locations, mm -hmm. correct? Yeah. Yes. Well, you found zip ties. Mm -hmm. You asked him about it, and he says, these are for the bushes around the pool. Yeah, that it was just for the pool. You found ladies' nylons not yours, um, and he said that they were for you. Right. Were they still in wrappers? No. He says these are for you. Right. So what he did is he's saying, I bought these, unwrapped them, wadded them up, stuck them in a paper bag with zip ties and yeah. put them behind the dryer and... Well, the dryer was, yeah, at his, um, he had an apartment for about five months. Right. And, um, and so, yeah, they were hidden there. He knew I was being snooping, like I was snooping. And so he said that he put those there um, because he knew I was going to find them. And so, yeah. And, and then you <laughs> found syringes. Mm hmm I did, yeah. And he says these were left over from his job as a physician's assistant. Right, which he worked nights at that particular hospital where he probably would have had access to those meds. And so it didn't seem weird. It wasn't like he had a hammer or something with him. It was, you know, he's not a carpenter. He wouldn't have had that. But the, um, <clears throat> the syringes didn't seem super weird. But however, when I did find those things, I did say, you know, to myself, I thought, well, maybe he's using the, the needles for his own personal use. You know, he works a lot. Maybe he's depressed. One medication I found was something with a, um, like, it, like when I Googled it, it said something about, like, um, depression or something. So maybe, you know, he was shooting up because he was depressed. I don't know. I mean, nothing. But you found depressed. medication. Mm -hmm. Yeah, a couple times I found vials of meds, too, in his car. But I thought, okay, he, he works. I mean, it's just, I mean, it, again, it, I didn't think it would be that weird to have 
you know, medication because he's in a hospital. So, you know, he goes into a room, pulls that out of his, you know, coat and, you know, shoots, you know, puts whatever medication into the syringe and gives the person, you know, medication. It didn't seem that weird. It wasn't that far-fetched. Yeah. To me. Doesn't, yeah, of course. But you, you've never worked in a hospital. No. <laughs> yeah, because that's not how yeah. that, that's not yeah. how that works. They, yeah, I don't know. I don't. Well, it, because you, really, you don't know. And I, mm -hmm. I don't want to make light of that because... Now we look at it in this context and it seems more obvious or, or yeah. more noteworthy, right. but at the time I, I can understand how it might not. Did you ever notice that the, the SUV was draped, the windows were covered? His car, a couple times, I did see where the blankets were like, you know, on the seat of the chair and then mm -hmm. up. I did see that. And um, I would ask why, and he would just say, you know, when I have to sleep in the doctor's lounge at night, it's, you know, I'm sitting with two chairs propped up, and he's six foot four, so he's pretty tall. Mm -hmm. So I could just picture him sitting with like two small chairs, and so he'd say he'd go out there and sleep at night. Did you mention this to anyone else? Any of the things that you found? You mentioned I, to your mother? I did. I did talk to my mom. Right. Uh, yeah. And she had an opinion. <laughs> yes, <laughs> mothers do. <laughs> Um, mine especially. My, I'll just say my mom watches a lot of crime scene shows. One day when I told her that, you know, I found this brown paper bag with those items that were I listed, she said, could Lonnie be raping women? And I'm like, okay, and I don't want to say it on TV, but of course I said, are you, you know, something me? You know, like, you're kidding. This is, like, seriously. And she's like, oh, yeah, that sounds, yeah. And, um, and so she kind of reneged on it a little bit. Um, but, of course, I didn't think that. I just was looking at always the affair. So everything I found... I just spun on it, but for her. Even when I found this stuff, I was like, oh, the nylons are for her. Oh, the zip ties, she's weird, she likes that. Like, it was just, <laughs> I know, it's stupid. But um, I couldn't get off of that, like, I just. So you, you explained it away in your mind by saying yeah, there's because... something he's doing with S Sweet Baby over here. <laughs> right? He's... I've got another name for her. Yeah, well, I... <laughs> yeah. Okay, yeah. Well, lots of bleeps in there, but There yeah. were questionable items that the police found uh, yeah. in the car, correct? Mm -hmm. uh, they found blankets and bedding covering mm -hmm. the car's rear window. Mm -hmm. uh, they found syringes loaded with an unknown substance. These were not syringes, they were loaded. They were. Uh, rubber latex gloves, several nylons, adhesive tape cut into strips, uh, metal handcuffs, metal leg restraints, plastic zip ties, multiple vials of prescription drugs, mm -hmm. sedatives, flashlight stun gun. Mm -hmm. They found strips mm -hmm. already torn and yeah, pre, was, pre yeah, set. Yeah, the tape, um, I, I, they did show me pictures of it. And um, if you're sitting in a car like this, the little center console here, the, the tape, um, like duct tape or something, had like gauze on it. And it was like two right here. And when they asked me about it, I'm like, oh, I could totally see that for your eyes. And they're, they're like, what? And I was like, I don't know, I'm just picturing like, you know, when you go to a spa and they put you know, on your eyes or something. That's just kind of what I pictured. And so I don't know if that's what it was for um, because then he later said it was for his toe because he often had issues with the uh, ingrown toe or whatever. Yeah. I don't, yeah. Yeah, they didn't think it was <laughs> for his toe. No, I don't think it was. Um, in their police report, they said the vehicle was stopped by detectives for a traffic violation. Mm -hmm. They said, quote, it was observed by the detectives that the rear passenger compartment had blankets and bedding partially covering the windows, and that Lonnie Scott Keith consents to the search of his vehicle. He says, sure, you can look. Um, additional items found in a concealed compartment. You would see it, the naked eye, you would see it. There was a loop on the seat. You could tell that it opened. It was under the seat, but I don't feel like it was, you know... Anybody could well, see I think their point there. is it wasn't out on the dash. No, 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 no. It definitely wasn't out on the dash. Or, or whatever. Sure. Um, and they said it appears as if the vehicle was staged for another assault. Mm -hmm. Now, at, at this point, given this is the Chico Police Department press release, that's just a few bullets from it. Yeah. There was much more to it. Have you been living with a serial rapist? Allegedly, apparently. I mean, he hasn't gone to trial yet, so I don't know. Um, I'm just asking you what yeah. your gut tells you. Based on what I've seen, it, I think I might have been. All right, let's take a break. Next, after her husband was arrested for rape, Carrie wondered if somehow all of this 
was her fault. Well, Carrie's mother, Carol, joins us next with her thoughts on Carrie's blame game. Before Alani was arrested, Carrie did find some zip ties, medication, syringes out in the garage, and then she found them behind the dryer at his apartment. One was a knockout drug, and one was a wake-up drug. Every time she would question him, he would explode. When I found out that Lonnie was arrested for rape, I was extremely shocked. Before Alani was arrested, Carrie did find some zip ties, medication, syringes out in the garage, and then she found them behind the dryer at his apartment. But he always had an excuse. He said the zip ties were for tying up the pool. The medication was left in his lab coat. And it made sense. Everything he said could be excused. Carrie texted me pictures of the medication, which I looked up online and found out. One was a knockout drug and one was a wake-up drug. He was working so much, I thought that Lonnie was actually doing drugs. About a year prior to all this happening, Carrie thought Lonnie was having an affair. Every time she would question him, he would explode, punch a hole in the wall, or he'd throw things. I would never have thought Lonnie would do this. Sometimes I feel like I just need to get out there and scream. I still have days where I can't believe he's done it. Then other times I wish I could just slap the hell out of him. How could he do it to these girls and to his boys? They're devastated. Lonnie has said that he wants his day in court, but we are preparing them for the worst. I think he looks guilty. Okay, well, I'm here with uh, Carrie and her mother, Carol. Carol, you were suspicious of him long before all of this broke, right? I was suspicious more of him having an affair. Right. Um, but I became more suspicious with, with things that Carrie found yeah. of something else going on. Mm -hmm. Now, and let me just clear something up right away. Um, it, sometimes we can get really frustrated with ourselves because we don't see something or it, 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 it doesn't jump out at us. But here's the thing. A normal person's mind can't go there. I mean, you don't just normally say A, B, C, Q, R, X. That's not how we think. And so it's real hard for us to even conceive that somebody might be doing something so heinous, so bizarre. And, and it's, it, that's a good thing that your mind can't go there, that you don't jump to a conclusion that later becomes obvious or confirmed. So mm -hmm. you, don't, you can't expect yourself if your mind went there, it'd be a pretty dark mind mm -hmm. to, to go in that way. So don't be too hard on yourselves mm -hmm. about that. What does bother me is that your daughter has said that she really wrestles with herself about whether or not some of this is your fault. I mean, just being honest, right. whether some of it's your fault, not just whether some of the Marital problems might be your fault, but whether or not because you didn't do what you need to as a wife that maybe he defaulted to this or was driven to this. Tell me what your thinking is. And just be honest. I can't help you with what you don't tell me. Right. Um, yeah, I mean, up until, <clears throat> excuse me, um, before I found out about the affair, I, I was just, I don't want to say just a stay-at-home mom because I was, that was, that's a lot of what you do for um, kids in your family, but that's what I did all day. So I didn't find it necessary at the time. Now, now looking back, I probably would change things, but um, I didn't wear makeup. I didn't do my hair. I kind of just stayed in yoga pants all day, those type of things. So, you know, um, so maybe if I did paid a little bit more attention to myself that way, um, you know, after I'd had my little guy, who's now three, um, he would sleep in the middle of us at night. And so it'd be Lonnie, a pillow, the baby, and then me. You know, so I mean, I kind of separated us. So, I mean, I don't know if, if that was it. How does that link up in a cause and effect way to somebody deciding that he's going to go kidnap and rape yeah. young girls? I don't take any part in that. I definitely, I don't, I don't, I think that that probably, if I'm thinking, I don't know, I feel like that probably is something like stemming from way back. Um, as, yeah, I just don't see that. But as far as, the, um, the affair, I mean, I feel like I probably wasn't, I don't know, I emasculated him a lot, and, you know. Well, 
I wrote down some specific things that you said because they were very troubling to me. <laughs> One is you said I should have seen what Lonnie was really up to. Uh, you said I should not have been a bitchy wife. Yeah, that I was. You said if I was thinner, more beautiful, more loving, <laughs> Lonnie wouldn't have raped other women. <laughs> Those are your words. Yeah. Not I said that. <laughs> yeah. I've always battled with my weight. That's always been a big thing. Um, funny, when I first found out about the affair, and I, you know, of course, went on a Facebook, MySpace, all that type of stuff to find her. And when I did, I'm like, oh, man, she's thin. That, like, really made me mad. Didn't care about the pretty part. I was like, oh, man. And so, yeah, that's, like, my own insecurity. But, I mean, I guess she was just there in a hospital and paid him attention and, you know, in a letter she wrote to him, she said, you know, I'll always let you watch football, I'll rub your back, and all this crazy stuff. And I'm like, okay, I've got four kids, I'm sorry. Like, I, I would, you know, I just, I just couldn't, I don't know, maybe just do the things that somebody else could. I, and now looking back, I mean, I feel like in the next relationship, you know, that I'll be so much better because I know what not to do. But we were so comfortable. I mean, I was with him since I was 15. You know, we just had 22 years of, you know, being with somebody. That's a long time. You get comfortable with them. Yeah, and I, I know that <clears throat> you, you seem focused on the affair because it's something that you can put a face and a mind to, mm -hmm. but your doubts extend to why he would go do anything, why he would turn away from you and go do these things. And you, you, let me tell you something. You can search through the literature, sociology, psychological, psychiatry, wherever, uh, on why rape occurs, why rapists rape. And I can tell you sexual gratification is very low on that list. This happens because of a demented sense of entitlement. It happens because of a sense of power and control and anger and rage and sadistic mentalities. Th this has nothing to do with how cute you are or whether a child slept in your bed or how much you weighed or didn't weigh. Do you hear what I'm saying? I do. Does she hear what I'm saying? I, I think she's trying to blame herself for a lot, and she's not the blame. This is a sick person who has done this, if, if he did it. Well, there was something and... that we discovered in Carrie's home that troubled me. We'll discuss that when we come back. The first four to six months were horrible. Mm -hmm. It was the worst of our lives. One of the producers had mentioned they heard a voicemail message. Yeah. With the kids and Lonnie? Yes, it is. As of this point, my son is the only one that knows about the rapes. My girls, who are 12 and 13, they don't know. I've just said that dad's been accused of hurting young women. This is just something that you wouldn't wish on your worst enemy. Well, that was Carrie, a mother of four, whose husband of 15 years made news last year after being arrested and charged with kidnapping and raping young women near the local college campus. She says she is now struggling to move past that scandal and put her life back together emotionally for herself and for her family. Now, when celebrities, politicians, or even other countries are caught in the middle of a scandal, many of them call my next guest to try and fix it. Judy Smith is one of the top crisis management experts and also the real life inspiration behind the popular character Olivia Pope from the hit TV show Scandal. She is also author of Good Self, Bad Self, How to Bounce Back from a Personal Crisis. So I asked Judy to meet with Carrie and her mother uh, at the Keith home in Northern California. She made a house call, take a look. I'm here today visiting a family who is in very serious crisis. The husband and father has been accused of rape. It's a family that needs help. Hi. Hi. 
Hi, Carrie and Judy. Come on in. Thank Come you, in. thank you. It's good to see you. I kind of want to start from the beginning. You guys go way back. We had a really good marriage up until about 2011. I found out that he was having an affair. Did the kids know that their dad had cheated? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. And yeah. how did they find that out? I think they just saw a lot of the arguing. Tell me about Lonnie's arrest. How did you feel about it? I felt numb. Like, how am I going to tell my daughters? How do you think the kids have been dealing with it? The first four to six months were horrible. Mm -hmm. It was the worst of our lives. One of the producers had mentioned they heard a voicemail message. Yeah. With the kids and Lonnie? Yes, it is. Hi. Lonnie. Carrie. We can't get to the phone. Leave us a message. Bye. Hard. Yeah, it's definitely hard. It's, you know, he's a part of our family, and, you know, you just can't forget that. Where was the zip tie and the nylons? There was a box, and I just, I would snoop everything up. And I found a brown paper bag with the nylons, the zip uh, ties, and the syringes. What did your mom say? What yeah, did she think? Well, she said, could he be raping women? And oh I'm like. Oh, my God, so your mom thought that. My mom right. watches a lot of crime scene shows. Do you feel as a family that all of you are victims as well? We're definitely victims. If he's found guilty, do you think you'll ever be able to forgive him? No. No. There won't be any forgiveness. So you think he might be found guilty? I think he's going to be found guilty. I hope it's all right if I talk to your mom as well. So, Carol, obviously everybody was shocked. What did you say to him when you found out? I told him, Lonnie, basically, what they found in your car it makes you I don't see how you could explain all that stuff. I trusted Lonnie 100%. What do you think now? Now, I am so unsure. How do you think it would affect your, your daughter and your grandkids? It's going to be really hard on everybody. Tony will be my biggest worry. Yeah. Even though Lonnie's not his biological father, he's afraid that even having the last name would affect that. Would affect him. Your daughter looks at you as a rock. Who's there for you? I'm there for me. It is um, very stressful. Thank you for having me into you guys' home. Well, Judy, I'm, I'm glad you went up there, and we've got yeah. a lot to talk about here. Um, first, let's talk about this answer machine message. Mm -hmm. um, that seems really odd to me, that you still have the same <laughs> answer machine message with his voice on there greeting anyone that calls your home. I wanted to actually just delete it, erase it. Um, and then the kids didn't want to. They, they like hearing that. And um, I did video record it that way. I can always have the kids' voices because my little guy was like, I think, two or really young when we did it. And so he sounds super cute on there. Um, I'm ready to. It's just they kind of are. You know, no, we don't want to. There's times where I turn off the machine and it goes to voicemail, but then we don't get our messages. So, um, yeah, it's, I, I would be okay with it. I think you will probably re-ask them again, because I think I asked them maybe like four or five months ago, and the first six months <clears throat> was hard, and then the last couple of months have been better. So they might be ready now. I also get the sense, and I'm interested in Judy's uh, uh, take on this as well, I get the sense that there's a part of you that's still kind of defending him. When he calls, um, I say, just tell me, why, why, was, why, was all the, why were all those things in your car? And he always has, you know, oh, that was for the poor. He always has a great excuse. I'm like, Lonnie, they have this. They have so much information. Like, how could, like, are you going to pull a rabbit out of your hat? Like, seriously, what's going to happen? And he's like, you just have to let me have my day in court. I work with corporations and celebrities and, you know, all of that sort of stuff. And we see and I've come to learn that everybody's the same, right? We all get ourselves in, in trouble, but at the core, it's that, it's that um, issue. Like, how did we get there? What, what, what happened? And I think for you along the, along the way, and a lot of times clients need this, sort of that big shock, right? Um, there were, there were a lot of warning signs. Are you entertaining that this might just all be a mi big misunderstanding? No, I'm pretty sure it's not. Um, I mean, if so, um, I mean, because they've had him for over a year now in um, police um, custody. I think the bail is $3.2 million. Yeah, yeah, it's pretty high. There's 
strips of tape pre-torn yes. in a vehicle with syringes and sedatives and duct tape and handcuffs. A lot of stuff. I didn't know about the handcuffs. I didn't know about and, uh, the stun gun. Those things, like, actually, um, right before Christmas time, um, he had gotten, um, he was saying, oh, I'm going to go all out this year for Christmas, which he does. And um, he had said, don't go opening up any boxes and things like that, you know, don't, don't check your email and all that. And so he had, I later found out that that's when he bought the stun gun and the handcuffs and the leg restraints. So I didn't know about those things. Well, okay. <laughs> well, all right, we're going to take a break. Um, and when we come back, uh, Carrie's oldest son, Tony, is 15 years old. And he feels that he is now the man of the house. Should that be his role now that his father is gone? Well, we're going to talk to Tony next. Are you angry with your dad? I'm just angry that like we had a good life and he threw it all away. Has there been any bullying? One kid said that your dad raped those two girls because he wasn't getting any at home. The fact that my husband Lonnie is still in jail, all of our resources went away. For 12 years, I had been a stay-at-home mom. Income was no longer there. Times are tough financially. I've decided I have to let my house go, that I just can't afford a mortgage payment. It feels horrible. We have friends here, and to have to walk away from all that, it's hard. Carrie says that her world was shattered last year when her husband Lonnie was stopped by police who found a stun gun, handcuffs, zip ties, ladies' nylon, syringes, prescription drug vials, adhesive tape, and metal leg shackles in his car. He was then arrested for allegedly kidnapping and raping women. Now, cr top crisis management expert Judy Smith met with 15-year-old Tony to get his thoughts on this scandal that made news and rocked his family to the core. So, Tony, are you angry with your dad for putting you and your family in this situation? I'm just angry that, like, we had a good life mm -hmm. and he threw it all away. It's all gone. When you first heard about it, what was your reaction? Very shocking. Do you still think he's a good dad? Was he a good dad? Yeah, he's a good dad. I don't understand why he did it. I think there were signs, but I just don't think anybody picked up on it. How have kids been at, at school and maybe online? Has there been any bullying? There's a website that people can make comments. One kid said that your dad raped those two girls because he wasn't getting any at home. Let's assume that your dad is found guilty. Are you concerned about your younger siblings? Yeah, my sisters aren't going to have their dad to like walk him down the aisle and stuff like that. Somebody told me that you wanted to change your name. Yeah. Do you feel in some ways that changing your name is going to make it better for you so people won't associate you with him? Yeah, I do. He's not my biological father and don't feel as close to him. So we know that um, your dad has been charged. It's still a trial and hasn't been convicted. If that happens, is that scary for you? Yeah, uh, not a lot of people like those kind of people in jail. Mm -hmm. So they tend to hurt him, I guess. Yeah. You fear for his safety, his life? Yeah. You still love him? Mm -hmm. Always will? I still see him as my dad. That's where you want to keep him? Mm hmm okay. Thank you, Tony, for taking the time. I really appreciate it. I know it was hard, but I, I do. Thank you. You're welcome. Well, joining us now is 15-year-old Tony. Um, Tony... I appreciate you being here. I wish we were talking about a million other things uh, than this. Judy, what are the most important things for Tony? I mean, kind of what's the Judy Smith fix-it plan for managing this scandal from his point of view? Yeah. Um, I think it's going to be critical for, for Tony. I agree, which is that he can't take on the role as a father figure. I wrote down the things you said. Number yeah. one, you said, don't try to be the man of the house. You're not a substitute for the father. Mm -hmm. Ignore people who may use the situation to hurt you. It's your right to say you don't want to discuss. Right. That's um, exactly right. We had talked a lot in terms of kids. You know, oftentimes kids can be mean mm -hmm. and, and bullying. And a lot of times when kids do that, it's about their point of view. It's not about, it's not about the person. And you say and it's important, important.
to realize that he did not create the situation and could not have prevented it. That's right. Tony is not responsible for it. And oftentimes, we feel bad like we could have done something. And no, we couldn't have. It is his mess. He created it. He has to, he has to deal with it. How do you feel about his attitude about wanting to change his name in terms of managing this scandal and crisis? I think it's a small part of it. I think it's a very small part of it. Changing the name, if that is to run from the crisis and not to deal with it, that is not going to be helpful whatsoever. You have to do those things in terms of addressing it and talking about it. But, but I do think that it gives Tony uh, a fresh start for him. In particular because while he loves this person, I'm sure still, it is not his dad. So I, I, don't, I don't see that as a, as a problem, but it has to be part of a bigger solution and part of a bigger plan. Yeah. All right, Carrie says that she's lost her husband and his income after his arrest one year ago and doesn't know how to dig herself out of this crisis. Well, we'll see what our fix-it expert, Judy Smith, has to say about her management plan when we come back. reality is Lonnie may never come home. I hope for the sake of my kids that he is proven innocent. I just don't want them carrying that stigma around with them forever. I do need help. I need help with how to talk with my kids. I don't want them feeling like they at all had a part in this. That was Carrie who says she does not know how to deal with the scandal of her physician assistant husband Lonnie Keith being arrested for allegedly kidnapping and sexually assaulting at least two women over the course of 18 months. Now, crisis expert Judy Smith has spent time with Carrie, also a mother of four children, and has put together a fix-it plan. And I, I don't mean to say that to suggest that this is an easy fix or something that just goes away with a couple of little spins, uh, but you do have some important kind of talking points for her. And you started where I started, which is stop blaming yourself. That's the first one. We have it up on the graphic oh, as well. Oh, great. No, absolutely. Look, Kara, we talked about this the other day. It is very hard to not to blame yourself. But you are not the blame. You cannot take responsibility for his actions. That is going to be your first starting point in order to move forward. But I want you to also see in that that it is a huge opportunity. It is because you, you can reinvent your second half of your life, right? What do you want to do? So I think part of what you want to think about is not a job, but what you want that career to be like. And you said that she needs to let go of Lonnie's baggage and start building this new life. I mean... Yeah. Fair or unfair, it is what it is, and the sooner you get started, the better off, right? Yeah, and, and letting go of the baggage relates to the first point, which is coming to terms with, I did not do this. I did not cause this. So you can put his baggage some other place and put it out of your hands. And that, that's, that's important. And that's you said important. reputational management's important. Yeah. And one of the things that you say is you got to plan ways to discuss this with family and friends that you're comfortable with. And the point is, people are going to see her at church or the store right. or in the pickup line at school or whatever. Uh, some people are going to bring it up. Some people are going to like, oh, I don't know what to say. Mm -hmm. She's got to come up with, here's what I say, here's what I do, so you don't have to think about it fresh every time you're with somebody. Have That's a plan. Right. I, I, absolutely. You and I both feel it's important to seek family counseling. Please allow me to make that a gift from us to Thank you guys you. and Thank make so that much. arrangement to, to help all of y'all sit down and think through this. And yeah. we'll make those arrangements for you back at home. Okay. So you do have someone I appreciate to that. talk Thank to. You. And you're going to need maybe some life coaching and career thinking. Yeah. And, we, we want to help you with all yeah. this because you're the victim here, not the perpetrator. Mm -hmm. All right, I thank you for coming thank here. You. Thank you. We'll be right back. You know, when 
people get into a crisis or a scandal, some folks don't know, but there are people that you go to that help you through that. And Judy Smith is one of the top crisis experts in the country, and she has helped rebuild the reputation of celebrities like Wesley Snipes, Jesse Jackson Jr., Monica Lewinsky, NFL quarterback Michael Vick, and many others. Now, there are some people who are not her clients, but if they had a brain in their heads, they would be, <laughs> because they would certainly benefit from her expertise. So I just kind of want to talk about this. Here's a clip of a controversial public figure, New Jersey Governor Chris Christie. Ah. Traffic nightmare, a deliberate act of revenge? Stuck in traffic for four hours? All because they didn't support New Jersey Governor Chris Christie? Wildstein's attorney claimed that evidence exists tying Mr. Christie to having knowledge of the lane closures during the period when the lanes were closed. Contrary to what the governor stated publicly, I had no knowledge of this, of the planning, the execution, or anything about it. And then I first found out about it after it was over. And even then, what I was told was that it was a traffic study. Okay, people always say politics, are, you know, they're first national, then they say, no, they're local. Local. Yeah. I think they're personal. Yeah. And if you're sitting on that bridge for four hours, you are pissed off. And if you then find out he did it right. as retribution, you're going to be, like, hugely pissed off. What's he do now? No, absolutely. But th this is what he did, which was right is that he came out, and he's done this twice, uh, at least, is to say, I did not have any knowledge of it. I didn't know anything about it. And he has said that, and he has denied it. Now, what's going to be the problem here is that what happens in crisis oftentimes is that when you start an investigation, you're going down this road, you see something that takes you down that road. And then that road is a very dangerous turn because we don't know where that might lead. All right, we'll be right back. I'd like to thank all of my guests today. Special thanks to Judy Smith. Uh, Judy's book, Good Self, Bad Self, How to Bounce Back from a Personal Crisis is currently in bookstores. And let me tell you something. You can use this in your everyday life. I have read it cover to cover. Mine is marked up. Yours will be, too. We'll see you next time. Thanks so much. Thank you. Uh, Thanks so much. Uh,